right, so here is part two of unit five, a uh, simple harmonic motion. So simple harmonic motion, we are going to talk really about two things, springs and pendulums. Um, simple harmonic motion is all about oscillations, so things going back and forth, back and forth. Motions that repeat themselves. Um, and one oscillation is just considered to be, you know, one full motion before the motion repeats itself. So for um, a pendulum, it would be if I start here, the pendulum swings this way, it goes back to where it started. That would be one full oscillation. Um, for a spring, we're going to talk about stretching the spring, usually to the right, letting it go. Spring would snap back left, go back right. When it gets there, that's one full oscillation. So a couple of terms we have um, related to oscillations, things going back and forth. Period and frequency. We've seen the term period before. That's just the time for one complete cycle or one complete oscillation. It's time. That'd be measured in seconds. Frequency is the number of oscillations per second. So specifically, you know, stop your stopwatch at one second. How many times did that thing go back and forth? That's measured in hertz, um, so one hertz be one oscillation in one second. Period and frequency are inversely related. Um, so if you know the period was two seconds, took two seconds to go back and forth, frequency would be a half. I would have done half an oscillation in one second. So two oscillating systems have periods T1 and T2, with T1 less than T2. How are the frequencies related? Well, they're inversely related. So if T1 is less than T2, F1 should be greater than F2, which would be C. You can just check that with numbers real quick if you want to. T1, you know, is less than T2. So let's say T1 is 2 seconds. T2 is 4 seconds. Again, it takes 2 seconds to go back and forth. 4 seconds to go back and forth. The frequency would be 1 half, and that frequency would be 1 fourth. So F1 would be greater than F2. Pause here for one second um, just to talk about the graphs of trig functions. And you need to know, well, it'll be helpful if you know four graphs, but you need to know cosine and sine graphs. So just remember the shape of a cosine graph does not start at zero, it starts up high. Starts up high, ends up high for one full sort of oscillation, um, one full rotation, one full circle, um, and that would be the two pi radians. So one full motion, cosine graph looks like that. Max value, positive one, min value, negative one. So cosine graph. I also want you to know the opposite of that, a negative cosine graph. So if I'm referencing a negative cosine graph, just flip that over. So you start down low. Just flip it. So max would still be 1, min would still be negative 1. Just flipped. Um, and I don't actually need you to know regular sign, but I do need you to know negative sign. But let's just start with regular sign. 
sine graph starts at zero. Now we have one full cycle, two pi radians, max and min are still one, negative one. So negative sine, you would flip that. So it is helpful to know these graphs. Um, we, we will deal with trig functions. Why do we deal with trig functions in simple harmonic motion? Because we're talking about something that repeats itself. The trig functions repeat themselves. Here was one cycle, but it's going to do the exact same thing. And on and on and on. So regular cosine graph starts up high. Starts with a positive maximum displacement of 1. Negative cosine graph starts down low, negative 1. Negative sine starts at zero but goes down first. So these are really the three graphs we're going to kind of refer to in this unit. Okay, so this will make a little more sense in a moment, but our um, position function for a spring, we'll start with talking about spring first. Um, is this formula, a cosine mega t plus 5. I know we don't know what most of that means right now, but it does make sense that the position for a spring going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, does relate to a trig function. Um, and if these values, that's supposed to be a, um, which is really the maximum stretched position of maximum uh, amplitude, or the amplitude. So an A, omega, and phi are constant. The motion is considered simple harmonic motion. As opposed to damped motion, damped motion would be um, the oscillations die out, and the spring would stop oscillating eventually. So simple harmonic motion, you know, is an ideal scenario where it would be like frictionless, no energy would be lost at all. Anyway, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about that. All right, so first of all, for uh, motion to be considered simple harmonic motion, there has to be a restoring force. Um, and the restoring force is always sort of trying to bring the object back to the equilibrium spot. So again, we're just talking about springs and pendulums. Um, so we do know that there, you know, the force from a spring is Hooke's law, negative kx. So the restoring force is proportional to the object's displacement, okay, x, you know, that's its displacement and opposite in direction. So that's hence our negative sign. So a basic question pops up sometimes just about the restoring force. So for simple harmonic motion, um, the restoring force negative kx, the only thing that makes sense here that could possibly represent negative kx would be a. You know, there's no negative sign here. These two are based on a squared factor that's the only one that could be a restoring force. All right, so a hanging spring has length 10 centimeters. Um, 100 gram mass is hung from the spring, stretching it to 12. What would be the length of the spring if its mass were replaced by a 200 gram mass? And just be a little careful about hanging springs um, we rarely care about the length of the spring itself. We just care how much was it stretched from its resting spot. So when you have that negative kx, x is the displacement from the equilibrium position. So if 100 grams stretches it really 2 centimeters, 10 and 12. 200 grams would stretch it twice as far, 
the force, you know, mass is related to weight, that would be the force. Force is proportional um, to the displacement. So if you double the force by doubling the mass, um, you would double that stretched position. So 100 stretches at 2 centimeters, 200 is going to stretch at 4 centimeters, so the total length would be 14. Okay, same for a pendulum. A ball is hung from a rope making a pendulum. It's pulled five degrees to the side. The restoring force is one newton. What will be the magnitude of the restoring force if the ball is pulled 10 degrees to the side? All right, well your angle here is essentially your displacement. If you double that displacement, you're gonna double that force. So that should be two. Okay, so back to our little cosine equation here, trying to explain more about what these variables mean. Um, and you'll have that equation on your equation sheet, but I would still memorize it or get it in your calculator. So, x is the position, it's the displacement at any given time. Where is this spring? You know, is it at 5 centimeters, 0, negative 5, 0, 5? Where is it? A is the maximum displacement, so we call that the amplitude. That was as far as we stretched it in the very beginning. And so if you remember what I just said about cosine, you know, the maximum cosine function is going to be 1. So 1 times A will give you your maximum displacement. Your maximum displacement is that amplitude. Okay, um, the omega t plus phi is called the phase of motion, and I do technically need to put the phase constant in there, even though this is almost always zero, um, and this just depends on where the spring is when you start your stopwatch. At time zero, where is the spring? So again, we almost always are talking about stretching a spring to the right. So we are beginning at our maximum positive displacement. If we had stretched it to the right and let it go, and then maybe started the stopwatch over here, there would be a little phase shift. You know, I'd still have sort of that cosine function, but it would be shifted a little bit depending on when I started the stopwatch. But again, that's almost always zero for us. Okay, so A is the amplitude, phi, phase constant, depending on when we start our stopwatch again, almost always zero. What is omega? Omega is called the angular frequency, it's in radians per second, and it is essentially the speed. It's essentially describing how fast um, that object goes back and forth. So this is an important formula, 2 pi over t which should make sense, you know, like one, two pi ratings, one full cycle divided by the time period for one full cycle. It's essentially distance over time. So that's going to get you your angular frequency, sort of the angular speed. Or just the speed. Why are we describing something that moves back and forth with radians? Again, because they repeat themselves and we can use those trig functions. Every cycle is going to be going through a phase of 2 pi. Okay, so here is our spring picture. Um, and I want you to label the max displacement, max velocity, max acceleration, and the sine of each. So, the maximum displacement is just the maximum distance away from equilibrium. Equilibrium is going to be at zero. So my maximum distance away is here. So 
that will be a maximum um, displacement. The other maximum displacement, although it doesn't really look like it's to scale, kind of more over here, would be halfway through the full cycle. This mass is being pulled back towards its equilibrium spot, but now it's moving, so it's going to compress the spring. Then the spring's going to push it back. It's going to go back to its original amplitude and on and on forever. So maximum displacement is also here, but we would call that negative A, and back here. So those are all your maximum displacements. Obviously at this spot and this spot the displacement is nothing. Um, where is the velocity a maximum? Not at the same spots. Because we have pulled this back, we're releasing it from rest. So at this instant, its velocity is zero. The spring is pulling it, so it's starting to go faster and faster and faster. And when it gets to the equilibrium position, even though that's at x equals zero, that's actually the fastest it is going. It has been accelerated this whole time by the spring going to the left. The spring's been pulling it left, pulling it left, pulling it left. But now, as soon as it passes that equilibrium spot, the spring is now pushing back on it, slowing it down, slowing it down, slowing it down, until it would stop at its max displacement to the left. So the max velocity is when it is at the equilibrium position. And I'll put a sign on there, too, because this is going left. This will be negative V max. And here, this will be being pushed to the right, so it's positive Vmax there. Last thing, where is the acceleration the greatest? Um, well, the acceleration is the greatest also at uh, the max uh, displacements, where the amplitude is, where you have the max amplitude or the amplitude. Um, you have the greatest acceleration. That's, again, from the restoring force. You know, the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. Force is proportional to A, acceleration. So the bigger the displacement, the bigger the force. You know, if I pull this far to the right, it's pulling the hardest back left. Um, but the signs are opposite. So if I have a positive displacement here, I pull it to the right, I have a negative acceleration because the spring is pulling it left. I've moved it to the right, its position is positive x. Here, a would be positive a max because it is being pushed to the right, even though it is left. And then, of course, back to our original scenario. Okay, so I do think this is a pretty important s slide, knowing where you have your know, max position, max velocity, and what directions they're going, max acceleration as well. Velocity in simple harmonic motion, I know you're maybe not all in calculus, maybe you are, um, but technically velocity is derivative of position, so I don't know if you've studied that yet, but derivative of a cosine function is negative sine. So velocity is sort of this function. Um, and recall where recall where sign where, where negative sign is a max. So that would be a negative sign function. Sign is not a maximum at time zero.
sine would be a maximum not halfway through the cycle, you know, this is one full cycle, but a quarter of the way through the cycle. So sine would be maximum a quarter of the way through the cycle, which is what we tried to show here. Here is halfway through the cycle, here is a quarter of the way through the cycle. That's where you have the max velocity. Okay, so I guess you know, get that equation in your calculator, have that one handy as well. Um, it's just telling you the velocity at any given time for a spring going back and forth. Maximum velocity is really what's in front here, omega times A, the amplitude. There's your negative sine graph. So this figure shows four identical oscillators at different points in their motion. Which is moving the fastest? All right, so we know it is not at the endpoints. It's come to rest briefly at the endpoints. It's moving the fastest right there at the equilibrium spot. So that's got to be A. All right, and then acceleration is derivative of velocity. Derivative of sine is, or derivative of, oh, sorry. Derivative of sine is um, cosine, and you keep your negative sine. All right, so there's our acceleration function. The max acceleration. Um, will be omega squared over a, or omega squared times a, and again that's going to be a negative cosine graph, so your maximum positive acceleration is halfway through the cycle, maximum positive acceleration, maximum acceleration to the right is halfway through the cycle, for that spring, again that's when it was compressed all the way left, the spring was pushing right. So acceleration and uh, displacement are both based on the cosine function. Um, so you can just say acceleration equals negative omega squared times the displacement. Um, but again, they're at maximum values at well, they're at maximum values at the same moment, but opposite directions. Pull the spring to the right, that's positive, positive x. The acceleration is left, hence you get the negative. And just, you know, again be careful, we have the formula for max velocity, but it does not occur at the same time as the max position. So these are related, but not the time functions. And these are vector functions, so those positive and negatives do matter. They would be right and left. This one's just considering magnitude. All right, force law for simple harmonic motion. We, we mentioned that's Hooke's law again, negative kx. So just coming up with another formula, um, you can stick these together, and we just said A is related to X. At any given displacement, you can get your acceleration by that negative omega squared X. right here. Okay, so any particular x that I'm going to plug in, you know, at that same time, I get my acceleration by doing negative omega squared x. Okay, so I'm going to solve that for omega. You can see the negatives go away. The x's go away. So omega is really the square root of k over m. 
And if you remember what omega meant back in the notes there, I said it was sort of like the speed of the spring. So it's the angular speed of the spring, how fast it's going back and forth, is not um, based on the amplitude, but is really based on the mass attached to that spring and the spring constant, the stiffness of the spring. So this was just sort of a formula for the period in general. This can apply also to the pendulum. Um, but if the period was 2 pi over omega, I think we started with omega was 2 pi over t. You can swap those, solve for t, multiply t over divide by omega. Um, you get general formula for period 2 pi over omega. So if omega is k over m, now, dividing by that, just sort of flip it. So t is 2 pi m over k, square root m over k, for a spring. Again, handy formula to have in your calculator. There are a lot of formulas for simple harmonic motion. And again, as we sort of said that for omega, the period of a spring, the time it's going to take the spring to go left, back right, that full time for one cycle, does not depend on how far you stretch it. You stretch it really far, you're going to have a bigger force, and it's going to start flying back a little quicker. But still, the time to get from wherever you stretched it left and back to wherever you stretched it would be the same, regardless of how far you stretched it. Period does not depend on amplitude. Depends on the mass that that spring is moving and the stiffness of the spring, the k value. All right, four mass spring systems have masses and spring constants shown here. Rank in order from highest to lowest the frequencies of the oscillations. All right, well. Frequency is inversely related to period. So if I want the highest frequency, that's going to equal lowest period. And we just came up with a period formula relating um, K and M. So the period for the spring, 2 pi squared to m over k, which is relevant because you have these mass values and these k values. Um, so the 2 pi is going to be the same for everything. You're going to square root everything. It's really just what's going to give you the lowest m over k. So m over k here. So just plugging in for the period, those would all be my period formulas with m on top, k on the bottom. And again, I'm looking for the lowest period to mean the highest frequency. So the lowest period should be d. That would, be, that would end up being the smallest value there, m over 2k. You've got a 2 in the denominator. Um, B and C are actually the same. You're dividing by a half, so you actually can flip that 2 up, 2m over k. So these are actually the same, period. And then A would be the greatest p 
period, but lowest frequency. All right, I think you have a blank slide after this you could use. Um, okay, so another problem. An object oscillates with simple harmonic motion along the x-axis. Its displacement from the origin varies with time according to this equation. So here's your displacement equation. T is in seconds. The angles are in radians, amplitudes, and meters. So SI units. Determine the amplitude, frequency, and period. Well, amplitude, you just pull out of the equation. Remember, this was in this form. So that was my original displacement equation. So whatever is just in front of the cosine, that is your amplitude. So four meters. Frequency and period are related. I just need to be able to find one of them. Um, and we know, in general, period was sorry, 2 pi over omega. So what is omega? Omega is whatever comes in front of the t. So that's got to be 2 pi over pi. Or just 2 seconds. So it takes 2 seconds to go back and forth. And frequency is 1 over that. So frequency was 1 over t. So half a hertz. So it takes 2 seconds to go left and back right, and in one second, you know, you'd end up to the left, half a cycle has been done. You have half a hertz. All right, determine the acceleration at any time t, and specifically at one second. So how did my acceleration function relate to displacement? It was kind of the same thing, but whatever comes out front here is a little different. So A, at any time, just in general, was negative omega squared A times that same position function, that same displacement function. So given what I know for this problem, I would have negative omega squared, again omega was what was in front of the T, negative pi squared times a, which we said was 4 meters, a was what came in front of the cosine function here, and then just repeat your displacement function. Sorry. Okay. Okay, sorry. It's negative omega squared times your displacement function. So the 4 cosine pi t was my displacement function. So we're stick that there. And then omega was pi. Okay, so that would be your acceleration function in general, in terms of t. If I specifically plug in one second, 
you can do this on your calculator, cosine of just pi, because you're plugging in one second. So at one second, you're doing cosine of pi. You also just think of your graph Think of, okay, I got my cosine graph. Um, you know, two pi is the full cycle. Pi will be halfway. Pi is halfway through the cycle, so that is a negative one. So at one second, cosine pi is negative one. So then I have negative one for cosine of pi times negative. 4 pi squared. So you can multiply pi out twice, but I'll just leave it as 4 pi squared meters per second. And it would be positive because I got a negative sign here, but I'm also getting a negative 1 from the cosine. The max acceleration is sort of just what's in front here. So that, um, that also is the max acceleration, 4 pi squared. This time I don't have that like displacement equation to go off of. Um, and I think you have space after this. So a block with a mass of 0.2 kilograms is connected to a light spring for which the force constant is 5 newtons per meter and is free to oscillate on a horizontal frictionless surface. The block is displaced 5 centimeters from its equilibrium and released from rest. Find the period of its motion. Well, you know, I like that 2 pi over omega formula, but I don't know what omega is here. But you do have a specific period formula for a spring. And that's certainly helpful and relevant because you have mass and you have the spring constant. on your own notes if you want, but I'm just going to do that. So I'm going to do 0 0.2 divided by 5, square root of that, and then that times 2 pi. So I get a period of 1.26 seconds. Determine the maximum speed and maximum acceleration. sort of the formulas for maximum speed, maximum acceleration. Um, but I need to know its amplitude. I need to know the maximum displacement to do that. And I have it. All right, five centimeters, although I don't like the centimeters, I'm going to change that to meters. And I don't exactly have omega either. Um, I knew omega is sort of the opposite of this square root of k over m, or now that you already have t, you can say omega is 2 pi over t, so 2 pi over that 1.2 seconds. about five, that is five.
So omega is 5 radians per second. You can use that to get the max velocity, really max speed. So 5 times 0.05 and 5 squared times 0.05. So 0.25, yeah. And 25 times 0.05. Oh, All right, so there's max speed, max acceleration without those trig functions, um, which are some other formulas we know. Keep up with the formulas. All right, now just a little bit about energy. This is really not new. Um, we already know potential energies, one-half kx squared for a spring. So the maximum potential energy would be if you plug in the maximum x, the amplitude, one-half k a squared. Um, and just like the pendulum, we talked about conservation of energy with the pendulum as well, but when you have maximum potential energy, like you stretch that spring, the most it can go to the right, and let it go, it's not moving right there. So kinetic energy is zero when potential is at a max and vice versa. So again, we already know this. Um, and spring forces are conservative, so we're sort of ignoring friction. This is, again, assuming there's no frictional loss or anything here. Um, but the total mechanical energy should be the same uh, at any point where the spring is. So you can say the total mechanical energy equals the max potential. You also could say the total mechanical energy equals the max kinetic. Um, and at some other spot, you know, total mechanical energy would be the sum of potential and kinetic together. All right, so consider one full oscillation for the spring on the left, label where it reaches its max potential and kinetic energies, and graph those sort of on the graph below. So max potential will be where it's stretched the most. So this will be U max, U max, U max. So stretch the most of those spots, maximum potential energy. But bear in mind, potential energy and kinetic energy here are never going to be negative. So we don't want to have um, a graph going below the x-axis. So that is the beginning of my cycle, exactly halfway through my cycle, and at the end of my cycle. So it's not necessarily going to be 1, but it would be here, beginning of the cycle, middle of the cycle, end of the cycle. And Potential energy would be zero when x equals zero, which would be here and here. So that would sort of be the um, potential energy graph. K is at a max, of course, here. here, even though the displacement is nothing, it is moving the fastest here. It's about to slow down as it passes equilibrium, but it's moving the fastest at the equilibrium spot. So that's where your kinetics are max. So it's just sort of the opposite of potential. That would be max. That would be max. All the max potential spots would be zero kinetic spots. So something like that. Again, these energies should not be zero. Or, sorry, 
His energy should not be negative. This is the same thing we just drew. Um, potential again is maximum at the start of the cycle, halfway through the cycle, back at the end of the cycle. So max potential beginning, middle, end. Kinetic would be a, a max not halfway through the cycle, but really a quarter of the way through the cycle, and then sort of three quarters of the way through the cycle. All right, so one more problem before we move into pendulums. Be a little short. Um, 0.5 kilogram cube is connected to a light spring for which the force constant is 20 newtons per meter and oscillates on a horizontal frictionless track. Calculate the total energy of the system and the maximum speed of the cube if the amplitude of motion is 3 centimeters. Okay, total energy um, you could get if you knew max velocity or max displacement, which is the amplitude which we know. So, so that was our spring potential energy function, 1 half kx squared. k is 20. The x is 3 centimeters, but plug in meters, 0.03. squared times 10, 0 0.009 joules. Okay, so that's the total energy of the system. That's also max potential, that's also max kinetic. What is the velocity of the cube when the displacement is 2 centimeters? And what are the potential and kinetic energies at 2 centimeters? Um, I kind of need to do C to do B, so let me do that first. Well, not necessarily, but um, potential energy at 2 centimeters. So So now you know the kinetic energy. If the potential energy is going to be 0 0.004 joules, the total energy is 0 0.009 joules, the missing has to be 0 0.005. 4 plus 5 is 9. So the kinetic there has to equal point zero zero five joules. I didn't write it out. That's really just doing total energy is U plus K. Now, if I know that is the kinetic energy at two centimeters, I can use regular kinetic energy formula to get the velocity at 2 centimeters. So kinetic energy 1 half mv squared. Sorry, it's a little cramped. And I'm going to say 0 0.005. That kinetic energy 1 half m is 0.5. Just solve for v. 0 0.005 times 2. Wow. Well, yeah, 
So I get 0.14 meters per second at that spot. And that's just conservation of energy. Okay, and pendulums are the last little thing we're going to talk about that uh, undergoes simple harmonic motion. They oscillate, they go back and forth. Um, so we're talking about a simple pendulum. Means there's just like a little point mass on a string going back and forth forever. Uh, so there has to be a restoring force, just like the spring force was negative kx. The restoring force here is sort of based on the weight. Um, it's this weight component, mg sine theta. We said in order for this to be considered simple harmonic motion, these little terms, again that was amplitude, sorry, have to be constant. So I'm trying to show omega is sort of constant here. I'm going to skip a lot of this substitution, but I'm plugging in um, A here, that's the restoring force. And X is sort of the displacement, but it's an arc length, it's a pendulum. So I'm plugging in L over theta, not exactly relevant, but we get 2, if we're solving for omega, we get this formula. And I said, you know, we consider a pendulum to be simple harmonic motion if omega is constant. But this does not look constant. This is based off of the angle. If you've got a different angle, you're going to have a different omega. So we do have a little restriction for pendulums. The restriction is theta has to be small, um, theoretically less than 5 degrees. Because if you plug in theta of 5 degrees, specifically in radians, the sine of less than 5 degrees over the actual radians less than 5 degrees. It's essentially the same thing. So theta, if theta were 0 0.0873, sine of theta would be 0 0.0872. So essentially we just cancel that out. Um, so this is the omega formula we use. And you should know for a pendulum. But it does technically have the restriction that the angle should be small. Just swinging back and forth through a small angle less than 5 degrees. And therefore the period formula, because again period was, sorry, period is 2 pi over omega, so you just got to switch omega, L over D. So those are relevant pendulum formulas to know. So a couple of little pendulum problems here. Christian Huygens, apparently the greatest clockmaker in history, suggested that an international unit of length be defined as the length of a simple pendulum having a period of exactly one second. What would this length be? All right, so we're talking about a pendulum. It mentions period. Just come up with that period for a pendulum formula. This says what would the length be, um, assuming that the period was one second. So I'm going to plug in time of one, and g, I just plug in 9.81. So rearranging.
So we're going to do 1 divided by 2 pi. Again, put that in parentheses when you actually do that. Don't do 1 divided by 2 and accidentally multiply by pi. So 1 divided by 2 pi. Then I'm going to multiply this square root of 9.81 over there. And then to get rid of my square root, I will square both sides. So about a quarter of a meter, 0.25 meters, that's how long the string length should be. So, sorry that graph didn't show up, but talk about a pendulum. Um, okay, so a pendulum in a clock has a period of two seconds. Again, that's the time to go back and forth once. You pull the pendulum to the right, positive displacement, and let it go. And we'll call that time zero. At what time... Um, at what time will the pendulum A be at its maximum negative displacement? So its maximum negative displacement is all the way to the left. So that's halfway through the cycle. All the way to the left would be at one second if the full thing was two seconds. So part A is B one second. Alright, part B. When will it have its uh, maximum speed? Well, just like the spring, it's moving the fastest at the equilibrium spot. Here it's at rest. It's about to speed up, speed up, speed up, get to the middle, then slow down, slow down, slow down. So, first time it's going to get to the middle um, is half a second, because all the way to the left is just one second, so half a second. That'd be A. Maximum positive velocity. So that's where it's going to the right the fastest. So still be equilibrium position is where it is moving the fastest, but if I specifically want to the right, it would have to go all the way left and then back towards the right. So that's one second, that's another half a second, so that's 1.5 seconds total. And maximum positive acceleration. So again, maximum acceleration is at an end point, positive would be to the right. So when is it about to start being pulled to the right? That would be, again, over here at one second. slide. Oh, I still need to do some discussion questions. But all right, pendulum is made with a metal rod. It keeps perfect time at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, but at a higher temperature, the metal rod lengthens. It's moving a little faster, expands. How will this change the clock's timekeeping? So if L is getting bigger, you're increasing that length, 
then you're also increasing the period. That's in the numerator. That goes up, that goes up. So that would, that would make your clock take longer time than it should. So we would say that the clock would appear to run slow. It's taking too much time and it would be behind the actual time. So, you know, it's supposed to take 60 seconds per minute. It's taking too much time. You would be behind that. Okay. That is simple harmonic motion.